Why don't we get started? A few of you are still getting food and eating, but please feel free to continue to munch away. My name is Frank Fukuyama. I am a <coughs> senior fellow here at the Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Freeman Spogli Institute. And I'm really uh, very delighted uh, to be able to welcome Professor Du Wei Ming uh, to CDDRL. He's actually a visiting um, professor here at Stanford. This is the third of three lectures that he is uh, uh, giving uh, in connection with the uh, Confucius Institute. I'd like to thank Professor Ban Wang. Where is he? There, OK. <laughs> he moved. Uh, uh, who um, was responsible for bringing him. But I'm really delighted to have this opportunity. I've uh, known Professor Du for uh, quite a few years. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have this um, uh, chance for a dialogue. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say uh, one thing about the governance project. Uh, it was very fortuitous that Professor Du uh, was here now because we are starting a new activity at CDDRL to look at the question of governance, which means the quality of government, uh, separate from the question of whether the government is democratic and abides by a rule of law or not. Because it seems to me that uh, we tend to conflate good governance and democracy, uh, especially in the United States. And we wanted to look at both China and the United States with respect to um, the question of how well they're governed, how do you conceptualize the relationship uh, between uh, good governance uh, and democracy? Does democracy help or hurt uh, or uh, uh, what? And so this is actually, so it was very lucky that Professor Du was here at Stanford. Anyhow, this is the first of several um, speakers that we hope to have uh, in the course of the uh, coming uh, year, and then uh, down the road a, uh, a workshop. Uh, so I would like to, uh, I, most of you need uh, no uh, long introduction to Professor Du, but uh, let me do that anyway. He is lifetime professor of philosophy and director of the Institute for Advanced Humanistic Studies at Peking uh, University. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, for many years <coughs> at Harvard, where he remains a research professor and senior fellow at the Asia Center. But he actually moved to uh, Beijing in 2010. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, prior to that, uh, he has taught in many uh, universities uh, in China and uh, the United States and in Europe uh, at Tonghai University, Princeton, uh, Berkeley. Uh, Peking University, Taiwan University, the Ecole des Hautes Etudes in Paris, uh, and of course at uh, Harvard. He is the author of, and I would say by far he is the most eminent um, Chinese American scholar of Confucianism. And I think in a certain sense part of the reason that he went back to China uh, was to reestablish a disrupted tradition uh, of Confucian scholarship uh, in the People's Republic of China. He's written uh, a number of uh, very eminent books on the subject, Confucian Thought uh, in Action, uh, Learning and Politics, Selfhood as Creative Transformation, and the Global Significance of Concrete Harmony, and uh, many others. Now, in um, discussing our format for today, uh, Professor Du actually didn't want to give a straightforward lecture, but actually wanted this to be a little bit more of a conversation between the two of us. And so uh, it's my job to actually kick this uh, off. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is talk about my view of the historical uh, development of government in China that comes out of the book that I published about a year ago, The Origins of Political Order, that actually has more chapters on dynastic China than on any other part of the world, uh, and which I found a very fascinating subject. Uh, and so I will talk for maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll see. We'll, uh, Professor Du will uh, react. And, and um, he's the expert on Confucianism, not me. So you should really listen to him and not me. But this is the way it's going to be, I guess. Uh, so the argument that I put forward in my book is that China never really got credit in the West for a really important accomplishment in terms of political development, which was, uh, in my view, uh, being the first society to establish not a state, but a modern state. Uh, and by modern state, I mean modern in Max Weber's sense of the word. Uh, that is to say, not patrimonial 
based on a bureaucracy that had a functional division of labor where people were promote, hired and promoted on the basis of merit that could exercise a uniform uh, bureaucratic uh, administration uh, over a, a very large territory. Uh, China was not the first state, but as a result of about 500 years of continuous warfare uh, in the spring and autumn and warring states period, just as in early modern Europe, uh, the pressure of this security competition, this military competition, uh, forced the development of bureaucracies, of tax authorities, uh, of a merit-based uh, civil uh, service uh, system. And Weber himself did not recognize, I think, adequately that the Chinese had uh, done this in the book that he wrote on Confucianism and uh, Taoism. Uh, in my view, what didn't happen in China in the subsequent years uh, happened in other world civilizations, which is first the creation of a rule of law. Uh, because in my view, where the rule of law exists, it has almost always come out of um, uh, a transcendental religion. So in Hinduism or in the world of Islam, in Western Christianity, in, in Judaism, uh, in all of these societies you have a highly developed uh, set of autonomous legal institutions that are originally um, located in, in religious uh, scholarship and interpretation of the law that act in a certain respect as a counterweight or a check on uh, political power. Most developed in, in Europe where the Catholic Church was a very formidable independent uh, uh, legal institution, uh, but that this didn't happen in China, partly because there is no real transcendental religion uh, that got going in China. There's been a long argument about whether Confucianism should be considered a religion. I don't believe, I mean, I think there are really some important differences between that and a real uh, religious doctrine. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore, you never had anything like the Catholic Church that was a source of legal authority that stood independently <coughs> Uh, of the emperor. You had plenty of law, but it was positive law, not law that constrained the will uh, of the emperor himself. And then, of course, in terms of institutions of accountability, of course, nobody in the world really had this until the 17th century. Um, but um, that, of course, is something that has yet to come to the People's uh, Republic of China. And so I would say that if you look at the sequence of the development of political institutions between China and the West, the sequence is really quite different. China, uh, beginning with the unification of China uh, in, in the Qin dynasty, the first national uh, Chinese dynasty in 221 BC, uh, you have a very powerful, extremely modern looking state that is capable of exercising power on a scale that doesn't exist in India, in the Middle East, in the Greco-Roman uh, world. It can do land reform, it can tax its own population, uh, and so forth. But that creates a kind of path dependency so that the Chinese state is then able to prevent the emergence of other social actors that could challenge its power. So you never get a, a blood aristocracy, you don't get a commercial bourgeoisie, you don't get an independent uh, religious establishment uh, in uh, subsequent uh, Chinese history. One of the interesting things now because we live in a very different world of capitalist economic growth, all of those things, I think, are happening. Uh, and, and one of the big questions for China's future is whether uh, those social forces will actually begin to create social checks on, on the power of the Chinese uh, state. Uh, however, uh, there is a substitute. And actually, I have a couple of chapters on, on uh, the Song and, and, and Ming dynasties in the section of my book on the rule of law because although you don't have a formal rule of law in China, you do have a Confucian moral system that in my view operates as a, you know, in, in a way as a substitute for uh, the formal law, institutionalized formal law that developed in, uh, in Europe. Uh, there are a <coughs> number of ways of illustrating this. My favorite one is when uh, Kublai uh, Khan uh, became the first Yuan emperor. You know, the, the Mongols finally succeeded in overthrowing the Southern Song dynasty and then created a Mongol dynasty in the whole of China. There was this interesting period in which this Mongol predator, basically, Mongol military commander, is surrounded by all of the Confucian uh, you know, court scholars and gradually socialized into the view that 
rulership is not predatory, that rulership involves uh, benevolence towards uh, the population. And you could see his transformation from a, you know, a nomadic predator uh, into uh, a Chinese emperor, and that that makes a very big difference. And I think to this day, uh, that continues to be uh, characteristic of governance in the Chinese-influenced parts of East Asia. So if you look around the world, where are there developmental states, successful authoritarian developmental states, where the state has not been predatory, uh, has turned policy towards economic growth in a way that you know, has tended to benefit the whole of the society. Uh, you can find you know, isolated cases of this in other parts of the world, you know, in Botswana. Well, Botswana was a democracy from early on. But I mean, you can find cases of this in other parts of the world. But the vast majority of them all cluster in East Asia in areas of the world that are under the influence of uh, Confucian values, uh, uh, Chinese Confucian values. Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, uh, and the like. All of these countries have been successful authoritarian uh, modernizers. And I don't think that that's an accident. I think that that is very much the product of this, um, this moral uh, inheritance that makes rulership you know, wh where, where, the, where the moral obligations of, of uh, rulership uh, dictate a, a different kind of authoritarian government. And just to conclude, as I see it, uh, just as a political scientist, the, the big challenge for China is that you know, they continue to do well what they've always done well for the last 2,500 years, high quality centralized bureaucratic government. Uh, it's extremely hard to run a country of 1.3 billion people from a centralized authority. And in fact, you know, they, they've had to decentralize the actual uh, governance of China in a lot of ways. And this then ends up producing uh, I would think actually insoluble administrative problems, which are ones that, that dynastic China also uh, experienced. And so one of the problems is if you delegate authority to a local agent, which you have to do in a country this large, how do you monitor the agents? How do you monitor the performance of your own uh, bureaucracy? In dynastic China, you know, the emperor did this by having a eunuch corps that was directly attached to the palace whose main function was actually to watch over the bureaucracy because he couldn't uh, trust the bureaucracy. And then the eunuchs would get out of control, and then you had to have people to watch the eunuchs, watch the you know, watchers, and so forth. And I think in many ways, you know, the contemporary People's Republic of China has very much the same problem, that you have to delegate authority to local government and, and party uh, organizations. But then how do you monitor uh, their performance uh, and so the way you do it is by layering, you know, more monitoring organizations, uh, centralized monitoring organizations uh, on top of one another. They're experimenting with things like polling and, you know, getting more grassroots uh, feedback. Uh, my personal feeling is that if democracy uh, finally comes to China, it will be out of a process like this where the information problems of running a centralized bureaucratic government for such a large and complex society are so complex that ultimately you can't solve it without more um, you know, bottom-up uh, or bottom, you know, grassroots accountability. I mean, that's the only way that you can actually find out what people want. Uh, and in a sense, that's what democracy is all about, is this kind of uh, grassroots accountability. But that's a question for, uh, <laughs> uh, for the future. So with that, I will turn the microphone over to uh, Professor Du. Well. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. And um, I think one of the highlights of my own uh, career in uh, dialogue debate was in 1996, I guess, I uh, was privileged to give a presentation on Beyond the Enlightenment. And uh, two of my discussants were uh, uh, Professor Fukuyama and James Buchanan. And uh, then we had a very long discussion. That was the beginning of our continuous uh, dialogue and debate. And originally, I was un under the impression I'm coming here for a major debate. Now I agree <laughs> almost uh, everything uh, you just said. So the, what I would like to do is to give you uh, maybe called a thick description 
as a background of understanding the issues that he raised. I probably would take a little bit more time than just 10 minutes. I'd probably do it uh, half an hour, something yeah. of that nature. Yeah. All the time you want. <laughs> but we still uh, very much want to have a chance to exchange ideas with you. And I noticed that uh, Professor uh, Larry Harrison is a very close associate of uh, Sam Huntington. He just uh, flew in uh, yesterday, so I hope that he will take part in the conversation here. Uh, the Confucian Zhen rendered as politics, Zhen Zhi in uh, modern Chinese, is defined as uh, rectification, also the character Zhen. Uh, it means to rectify the status quo so that it becomes correct. The assumption is that the right people, right institutions, and right ideas are defining characteristics of the right politics. Uh, the Junzi, or sometimes rendered as a Shi Junzi, the functional equivalent of what I would argue of the modern idea of the intellectual, uh, are considered the right people to rule. And uh, the Junzi, in this sense, is very different from the uh, Greek idea of uh, the philosopher, the Judaic rabbi, the Hindu guru, as uh, Francis already pointed out, the Christian priest, or the Buddhist monk, or even the uh, Islamic ul ulama. Uh, even though uh, an intellectual, in that sense, carries um, functions comparable to them, as exam moral exemplar, as a knowledgeable person, as a wise person, and uh, also as a person endowed with some kind of spiritual, um, spiritual exercise, as I pointed out in the first lecture. Uh, this idea, the modern idea of intellectual, of course, is from the Russian notion of uh, member of the intelligentsia. But in the Russian tradition, it's very clear that anyone who is an intellectual is definitely um, a critique of not only the government, but the establishment. So Shakarov was an intellectual, but uh, Gorbachev uh, would never become an intellectual in, in terms of that definition. Uh, modern Chinese have been deeply under the influence of this idea. But this is, of course, uh, not French, you know, not just Jean-Paul Sartre, but uh, Raymond Nahon is a close associate of uh, de Gaulle. Both were considered intellectuals, uh, certainly not the case in Germany or the, not the case in, uh, uh, in the United States. In the classical Chinese sense of the genes, uh, as uh, uh, maybe a public intellectual who's uh, politically um, engaged, uh, socially involved, and uh, culturally sensitive and informed. So the idea is uh, very much a person of the world and yet transforming the world from within. He's in the world, but not of the world. The uh, right institutions are made of, uh, again, in the classical sense of Li and Yue, uh, ritual or civility, and music. For Confucius, the paradigmatic personality is uh, the Duke of Zhou, who's uh, considered a major, construct, uh, major uh, builder, a constructor of, this, of the so-called Zhou system, a humane, effective, and enduring political system of governance. And that is uh, trustworthy, responsive, and responsible. So Mencius defines this particular kind of polity as uh, renzhen, as humane governance. Uh, I would say this is, of course, my own interpretation. Uh, five human resources are tapped to develop this kind of politics. First, uh, I would call it the principle of subjectivity, which means personal integrity, self-cultivation philosophy. Again, the, uh, my presentation in the first lecture. The second one is populism. In other words, the rulership is for the people and in a sense even of the people, but not by the people. Uh, this is one of the reasons that there are democratic roots, but democracy as a form of government never developed in China, and now China is still struggling to become one. There are a number of features of this notion about uh, institutions. Uh, one assumption is that those who are more powerful influential and have more access to both material and non-material resources should be more obligated to the well-being of the society at large. So in this sense, the emperor, the ruler on top, should be totally public-spirited, ideally. 
uh, the, the ruler on top can never become a private person. This is always public. And it's very interesting, in the last few years, uh, maybe four years ago, uh, Professor Han Jiabong, who is uh, a noted uh, scholar in uh, legal thought, and uh, submitted a dissertation for the law school. And the title is Confucianism as Constitutionalism. Uh, the argument is, uh, I have to do it simplistically, is that uh, constitutionalism as a regulatory system the primary purpose is to control those who are powerful and influential. So you have a regulatory process by which uh, power does not corrupt, and absolute power in, the particular, in this particular way does not corrupt absolutely, so the regulatory system. And he argues quite forcefully that if you look at the legal system in the Anglo-American tradition, not the German or French tradition, the uh, customary laws based upon precedent and so forth feature very prominently in traditional Chinese uh, legal system. And uh, the ritual, uh, Li, is so powerful that an emperor, you know, when the emperor was originally an heir apparent, he would be tutored by three eminent uh, Confucian scholars. Throughout his life, he'd be watched, you know, the public gaze is always on him. Uh, there's one person will record his behavior, any kind of behavior. The another person recorded any, anything he said. And uh, whenever he was in a in a situation, you know, like eating, if he overate, then the eunuch will plead him to, uh, to take care of his uh, health for the nation. <laughs> and his sex life was also carefully monitored and observed. So he's the one who's uh, contrary to Hegel's notion, the least free, and because uh, he is always in the public domain. So this is a kind of control that is considered uh, extremely important. It's not legalistic, but ritualistic and symbolically very powerful. And then the assumption is that uh, the ruler should always be on the side of the people rather than, or the intellectuals ought to be on the side of the people rather than on the side of the ruler. Uh, the famous statement uh, from Mencius, Ming Wei Gui, Se Ji Ci Zi, Jun Wei Qing, people are the most important. The state uh, is next, but the ruler is the least important. And, of course, the idea, in the modern idea, serving the people uh, may be very much of a modern coinage, but the idea of uh, the ruler is entrusted by heaven to take care of the people. It's very deeply rooted even before the time of, uh, of Confucius. And in this uh, particular context, uh, there's another feature, Another uh, resources that the ruler will have to, ta uh, have to tap, the intellectuals as well, that's historical consciousness, which means society comes into being through a process of evolution. It's very Durkheimian. It's very much in the tradition of Durkheim's notion about ritual as a way of organized society, uh, very different from uh, either Hobbes or Locke. Uh, the notion that society comes into being a polity because of some, some kind of contractual relationship. From this point of view, it's uh, imagined it's a fiction. No society ever existed because of contract. Uh, people's state of the nature then come together and form a contract and a society is formed. You know, it's always a historical process involving um, all kinds of forces, uh, often beyond the control of uh, a, a group, uh, not to mention an individual. But there's also a transcendent dimension, uh, often used as a mandate of heaven. I realized that the number of people uh, use uh, this as uh, a functional equivalent of the French idea of the divine right of king. Uh, I will argue it's just the opposite. The notion of the mandate of heaven is diametrically opposed to the idea of the divine right of king. Because the notion of rights, as you know, even the human rights, originally occur as the rights of the ruler or the rights of aristocracy to claim some privileges. But in the Confucian tradition, Heaven sees as the people see. Heaven hears as the people hear. Heaven does not impose some kind of uh, divine right to any individual. Heaven reflects the will of the people. So in this case, the, uh, the mandate of heaven is a regulatory system controlling the ruler. Uh, the ruler is not only controlled by people because of uh, the possibility of rebellions, but it's also controlled by the cosmic order. So if the ruler fails to perform, and then 
not only people would try to rebel against him, the heaven will not uh, necessarily, uh, uh, heaven will also abandon him. That's the, the idea of the laws of the memory of heaven, which is always related to the feelings of the people. If the people suffer, then the mandate of heaven will be lost. Uh, the fifth one, uh, in addition to what I mentioned about uh, the more powerful people ought to be, um, oh, uh, the, uh, the idea of subjectivity and populism and the transcendent dimension and historical consciousness, the fifth one is a future orientation. Any polity or politics is not designed for the present. It's not distribution of wealth and power for a contemporary situation always with, with a view to the future. Of course, the notion sometimes uh, hundred generations. So this reminds, of, reminds me of the African proverb about the earth. You know, earth is not a gift from ancestors, but a treasure entrusted to us by numerous uh, future generations. So if you want to design something like what Duke of Zhou was doing and Confucius wanted to do, it's always for future generations as well. Uh, what are the impl implications? Uh, first of all, the uh, society is a form of uh, organic solidarity. Again, Durkheim's notion, rather than the mechanic solidarity. So the fundamental difference between the Confucian approach and the legalist approach, <coughs> you know, the Emperor Qin, who organized this uh, incredibly powerful modern bureaucracy, was a legalist. The difference is this. From the legalist point of view, the two kinds of professions that are essential. One, the farmers, and the, the other is the, uh, the military man, the soldier. Because a society, a, a nation, needs a productivity on one hand and defense on the other, sometimes uh, uh, aggression as well. And this is, from the Confucian point of view, a mechanistic uh, solidarity. The, uh, the legalists were against merchants uh, because it's difficult to control them. And they're certainly very, very contemptuous of rulers, or of uh, intellectuals. You know, uh, buried uh, intellectuals alive and burning books. So this the legalists were very much interested in doing. And people, Mao Zedong once made the remarks, the legalists, Qin Shi Huang, they only burned 400, uh, buried 400 intellectuals. <laughs> I, I was able to get rid of more than uh, 2 million or 20 million. So this is legalistic Mo, which is uh, mechanic. Uh, arbitrary, and whereas the Confucian uh, idea is more organic. Therefore, the division of labor is very important. Not only the farmers, the, the artisans, the merchants, but also the intellectuals could, should all be recognized and integral part of that process. And of course, I, I even uh, mentioned once that the Book of Mencius is the defense of the role of the intellectual. Uh, the intellectuals cannot produce, cannot manufacture, cannot exchange goods but they are not useless because they help the governance and in, uh, sometimes in idealized <coughs> sense they can be critics and even teachers of kings. Uh, the second one uh, by implication of course it's uh, meritocracy. Uh, it's not election in the modern sense. You know we have the term xuanju as, uh, as a modern concept which uh, has not yet really occurred in the, in the, uh, in the general sense. You know, even though more than a billion people experience in voting at the village level. But xuan ju in classical Chinese meaning xuan, which means to select from above, ju, which means to recommend from below. So these rulers, or uh, these intellectuals are not only handpicked by the rulers, but they're also recommended by people. So that's the way to create that elite class. <coughs> and the core values, uh, I'm jumping ahead, the, some of the core values that can be easily contrasted uh, with uh, liberal democratic ideas, but I think I don't want to give you the impression they are exclusive dichotomies. They are complementary, but with different emphasis. For example, there's more emphasis on justice or equality. Uh, not enough on uh, freedom, especially individual freedom. A great deal of emphasis on the sympathy and compassion of the leaders. Not enough on uh, rationality. Uh, instrumental rationality even though very important in defining the efficiency of a bureaucracy, but it's never considered as the, uh, the real quality of a ruler. A ruler is not a calculator. The ruler ought to be a well-developed person, therefore sympathy and compassion. And 
legality is important. The law is the minimum requirement for security and maintenance of order. But it's civility, Li, again, because the notion is only through Li uh, the people will have or develop a sense of shame. And without the sense of shame, it's diff difficult to uh, not only to govern the place, to allow people to flourish. In other words, in a highly idealized sense, politics is the mechanism to provide security, economic well-being, but some form of prosperi uh, prosperity and education. So it's the best opportunity for human, not a human survival, but human flourishing. So it's very different from the conception that the political process is the minimum condition for security. Uh, great values, such as spiritual values, are totally individualistic. You know, you have the difference between the public political process and the matters of, of the heart, the private matters of the heart. But in this Confucian notion, these two are very much fused. Uh, of course, in this sense, as I already noted, responsibility. Responsibility is not an even... Uh, not evenly distributed. And the people who are powerless, for example, the, home, the homeless, may not have the sense of responsibility at all, except survival. The survivability of a homeless is a dignity in, in, the, in the broader sense of the term. But the ruler or the people who are well endowed will have a much uh, broader sense of responsibility. And in this sense, a certain level of social security, social solidarity, or social harmony um, is uh, more of a priority than uh, individualism uh, or sometimes even individual dignity. In this sense, the question about human rights, it's very difficult to develop in China, as many of you know, versus the respons uh, responsibility of the elite. Now, I discussed this with uh, Josh Cohen, who's uh, a professor here now and uh, worked very closely with uh, uh, John Rawls the possibility of a functional equivalent of the rights of the people by imposing very strong sense of respons uh, responsibility of the elite. If uh, the rulers are uh, held responsible for the well-being of the people, not just simply to protect their rights, and then the functional equivalent of some of the rights for the people to claim, not the rights in the political sense, but economic, cultural, social. I'll give you one example. In the rights consciousness, this is of course an extreme case. You know, I actually discussed this with, uh, with James Buchanan. You know, he originally just <coughs> considered freedom as an important feature for economic development. Later, after the Anran case, he felt responsibility was important. But even responsibility, last time we talked, is not enough. You have to have a sense of decency. Uh, if the uh, Billionaires are not decent, even though they are responsible, the society can still be milked to dry by them. So, in a very extreme case, um, I respect your right. I am a billionaire, you are homeless. I have no obligation whatsoever to help you. I respect your rights. If I give you one dollar, which means I'm exercising some kind of altruism, not controlled or implicated by my rights, or by your rights. But if I am powerful, influential, and um, you don't have any of these resources, if you make claims of the elite for some of the things, then certain functional equivalent of, uh, of rights may be developed. Of course, this is a highly uh, controversial point, but uh, we need to discuss it further. And in this sense, the private versus the public Again, it's not a very clearly distinguished feature of the Confucian tradition. Uh, last time I made, made it clear, a distinction has to be made between private and personal. Uh, private, from John Stewart's point of view, is the kind of privacy that protects many of the things uh, you want to be confidential. You want to share your diaries. Uh, you don't want to let people know your salary and so forth. These are private matters. But uh, personal, is something you feel strongly, but uh, not only you don't mind discussing it, you think these things you feel very strongly are discussable, debatable, and of course they are also falsifiable because this is a public accountability. The Confucians are very concerned about personal involvement. So you don't study something as a science totally distinguished from your involvement, especially in the political sense. 
you know, the Weber's distinction between politics and uh, science. But the Confucian notion about uh, <coughs> politics is very much Weberian in that connection. You're personally very deeply involved, and yet it's not uh, private. And the public spiritness is always considered a positive way. I'll give you one example. Again, it's highly uh, simplistic. You have to move beyond your self-centeredness or selfishness to become public. You, you move away, move above your, your private realm. Otherwise, you will not be able to uh, experience or enjoy the warmth of even your own family. Family is private then, but uh, nepotism will have to overcome. So the family will not be simply a private domain. Would, so community, uh, more public spirit area. Then the community can be parochial. Nation can be chauvinistic or nationalistic. Even the human community can become anthropocentric. So the public spiritness is to move from the self all the way to the, uh, to the world and beyond. And in this sense that uh, uh, in the opening text of the great learning, of course, it's the notion from the emperor to the, common, uh, to the commoner, each without exception, should regard self-cultivation as the root. But this statement is preceded by a rather elaborate statement. Now, many of you are quite familiar with that. The ancients who wish to bring peace to the world, which means all under heaven. Uh, by the way, the idea of all under heaven um, was the subject of uh, a, a workshop at, uh, at Stanford organized by Wang Ban. And the idea of Tian Xia Gong is not something that is universal. Uh, in America, for example, up to this point, it's extremely difficult for us to go beyond national interest. Uh, I remember there's a change. I had an opportunity to ask the question of Mundell. I consider him as a statesman. And he paused for a few seconds. He said, national interest is good enough for me. It's almost impossible for any leaders to make a public announcement that we are now moving beyond public interest. We consider some of the international organizations, their claims, as more illegitimate. <coughs> uh, legitimate. This is a very difficult problem. So from uh, the ancients who wish to bring peace to the world must first govern their states. Wishing to govern their states, they must first regulate families. Wishing to regulate families, they must first cultivate themselves. And of course, you can even add between family and state the idea of uh, community or society. But that's, that's something we need, to, uh, we need to discuss further. So the nature of politics, as so understood, has its own perspectives on authority, power, legitimacy, and law. This is substantially different from our modern conception of what politics really is. The priority of the moral basis of politics is, of course, taken for granted. Uh, it is inconceivable that uh, the people who are involved in the political process are not involved also in terms of their uh, self-cultivation. Uh, those who practice the art of science, art and science of managing the state affairs will have to be people with uh, personal integrity and ethic of responsibility. And so I will stop here, but there's one, one area that I didn't get a chance to go into. Uh, good people, good institutions, but also good ideas. And the good ideas are not politically constrained. The good ideas will have to be much broader to encompass uh, even nature and beyond. So the notion about anthropocentrism, in fact, is a limited notion about politics. The governance will have to go beyond the human world. In other words, the question about nature and religion, we have to enter into the picture as well. OK. <clears throat> uh, well, I want to open this up to a more general discussion uh, quickly. But I guess um, there's a question I've been dying to ask you <laughs> for some time. Um, I mean, it, and it's not about this, the, the theoretical issues that, that you brought up. It's more about the application of con Confucianism in contemporary China. <laughs> All right. So the theory you lay out, it seems to me, explains a lot about traditional Chinese ways of understanding political power, rulership, you know, the relationship of rulers to ruled, and so forth. But China is run by a communist party, which 
claims still to be Marxist-Leninist, and you know, it, at one point was trying to suppress Confucianism. I think your return to China and the you know eminent post that you hold in Beijing is a sign that things are changing and that China is trying to reconnect with this entire you know tradition that you have just outlined. But I guess my my question is, you know, how how does China actually recover this tradition? Because it would seem to me that the, you know the people actually running the country are you know, they operate according to actually more Western principles in, you know, in a certain respect. And how, you know, do you reconnect uh, or does it have to be just an informal process of, you know, the culture more generally and, and you know, not official doctrine or anything else? Well, I certainly expect a challenging question like that from you. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, uh, I've given some thought to this. I think normally we look at the Confucian tradition basically in a very um, charitable way to underscore the uh, most positive side of it. Part of the reason is very simple. Uh, ever since the, uh, just very short historical note, ever since the um, Opium War in the mid-19th century, every 10-year period from uh, 1839 to uh, the founding of the People's Republic in 1949, for that 110-year uh, period, every 10 years there was a major rupture. Uh, recently, there's a very, very fascinating book on the Taiping Rebellion. And of course, reviewed all its plaque. And uh, it's a very important book because more than 20 million people became displaced. It's a movement led by the uh, Christian fundamentalist, uh, Hong Xiuquan. Uh, then, of course, the un uh, unequal treaties, Japanese aggression, and uh, the Taiping, uh, after the Taiping, there's uh, uh, the Boxer Rebellion, the collapse of the Manchu dynasty. Uh, the emergence of the warlord period and the fight between the communists and the nationalists. So every 10-year period. And recently, there's a beautiful novel by uh, Qi Bang Yuan uh, talking about her own experience. Uh, almost uh, move from one place to the other uh, is uh, normal for an overwhelming majority of the intellectuals. From 49 to 79, with the beginning of the uh, reform and uh, opening period, every five-year period, there's a major upheaval from the Korean War to the Great Leap Forward, from the Great Leap Forward to the so-called Sanyan Kunnan Qi, the three years of famine, or three years of starvation. According to one account, the government official records to uh, 25 million people died of starvation, but I think normally we think it's well beyond th uh, 30 million people. And of course, then the, the uh, first part and the second part of the Cultural Revolution. And one thing we know about the Cultural Revolution is that, uh, of course, the destruction of human lives, but culture. And in fact, many, many, some of the most precious documents and ideas were burned for fear that the, that the Red Gods uh, would come. So China, for the modern history, has especially pitted against 2,500 years of the long history, loss of memory, uh, loss of uh, a sense of connectedness. For a while, some of the most brilliant minds in China, like Lu Xun, Hu Shi, Chen Duxiu, uh, Chen Shijing, and so forth, used the worst of the Confucian tradition or the Chinese culture tradition to compare with the best. So what is China from Lu Xun's point? AQ. And uh, not to mention uh, uh, the people who are um, spitting, uh, unclean, and uh, even uh, um, open smoking. And that's China. <laughs> and what's the West? It's uh, liberty, democracy, and due process of law and science. So it's a total destruction of the cultural tradition. I would say the destruction of what we consider the best. Uh, even the opening line of the great learning I just cited is a foreign <coughs> document for some of the most brilliant young students. At Peking University, maybe only 10% of the students are aware of what's going on. Uh, what, what is the meaning of that text? But anyway, no, the text in the, in the mid even in the early part of the 20th century, every educated person in East Asia, not just in China, uh, we say culture China, but Korea, Japan, Vietnam, everybody remember that, cite the great learning, but it's no, lo no longer. However, the Confucian tradition continue uh, as habits of the heart. And the continued Confucian tradition is the worst that we can imagine. So I, uh, let, me, let me give you a critique 
of the Confucian tradition from this point of view. If you live in a totally legalistic society, it's your behavior that you have to watch. If, if you violate the law, you'll be punished. It's only your behavior. If you live in a society that the Confucian idea was totally politicized as mechanism of control, it's a, a kind of insufferable society because the rulers are not only interested in your behavior, they're interested in your attitude, in your uh, belief, uh, in your unconscious world. And hopefully, what you do will be in response to the demands of the, quote, highest idea. So what is closest to you is the red sun rather than your own parents and your own uh, relatives. So le let me be a, a more dramatic. From the Confucian point of view, it is to move from what you uh, cannot bear to what you can bear. For example, I cannot bear the sufferings of my children and my parents. I even want to say, well, let me suffer. I, don't, I cannot bear. But normally, I can bear the suffering of a stranger because I don't know. But if you extend that sense of uh, unburied the sufferings to the stranger and beyond, then your humanity extends. The revolutionary spirit as embodied by Mao is just the other way around. The other way around, it, you, you move from what you can bear to what you cannot bear. You have to be able to bear the suffering of your enemy. You know, Lu Xun's idea, if the dog is in the water, you get rid of the dog because if the dog comes up, he'll still bite you. So your enemy, you destroy your enemy. But you destroy the people who've been with you for a long time, but they don't share the idea. Then you destroy the people who are your close friends, your relatives, even your parents, even your children. So that sense of, uh, but can you understand that independent of the Confucian value ideas? You cannot. So I think Benjamin, uh, Walter Benjamin is right. Some of the great ideas like Ga, once it is uh, intertwined and utilized by some of the worst power struggles, the Ga can turn out to be very brutal. Uh, that's how symbolic powers are sometimes used and abused. So in okay. this connection, I think we are now suffering from... Uh, the lack of understanding of the more positive ideas of the tradition and still uh, the uh, nepotism, the kind of uh, backdoor idea, corruption, and uh, consider my own family the most important or myself. All these problems will have to be understood in, the, in that broad context. Okay. Uh, let me just raise one other issue, a uh, more substantive, um, before we open it up. Um, so as a system of governance, it seems to me that the kind of Confucian ideal that you describe actually has some advantages over a procedural liberal democracy in the sense that if you cultivate educated, benevolent leaders, they are granted discretion you know, to govern uh, in a way that a rule-bound uh, uh, politician in a, in a Western democracy you know, can't do. And so, so that... Uh, at, the, at the high end, this means that you can get really high-quality leaders that can move their society ahead you know, very rapidly. So Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, you know, someone that uh, comes to mind. But the problem traditionally in that system where you're just relying on morality rather than procedural guarantees against abuses of power is uh, what the Chinese have traditionally called the bad emperor problem which is that every now and then, you may have a lot of good emperors, but you know, every now and then you get a really bad one. <laughs> and the last bad one was probably you know, generally uh, recognized as a bad emperor was Mao uh, himself. I, I don't know how much you can say this. I said it in China in front of a public audience and nobody got up and left, so I guess, <laughs> I guess you can say that. Um, and, um, you know, and it seems to me that in Chinese governance, this still remains the unsolved problem that in a democracy if we get a really bad president you know you just there's ways of getting rid of him um, but in China um, you know the, the the problem of that system as a system of governance is is ensuring a, a constant supply of good emperors when I raised this issue the, the last time I was in 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 China uh, I was debating actually somebody who's a kind of party you know a sort of 
party ideologue, and he said, well, you know, you haven't solved the problem of the bad people <laughs> um, in, in your Western democracies. But that, you know, I think is, that's a problem we, we have to deal with in, in modern democracy. But, so I just wonder whether you can say anything about that. Yeah. I think I, I would consider the problem even more complicated than that. And uh, first of all, um, the uh, Confucians, Confucius uh, in particular, recognized the importance of the legal constraint through law. But law is a preventive measure. Law in itself cannot generate a sense of shame. Uh, without a sense of shame, it's difficult to develop some kind of moral character. So I would consider the legal constraint is the minimum requirement for any ordered society. But it certainly falls short of a maximum realization of the human <laughs> potential. That, that's one observation. Uh, then, if you look at Chinese history, you know, because uh, we're still under the influence of Hegel and others, and the bad, the bad ruler, the bad emperor. And I haven't done it, but I think some of you are more uh, familiar with Chinese uh, history and computer technology. You can do a rundown of all the emperors in China now, ever since the Qing Dynasty. And my suspicions, uh, it's difficult for you to find many brilliant emperors, maybe just a few of them like Han Gaozu, Tang Taizong, maybe some of the great emperors of the, Qi, of the Qin dynasty. Nor can you find a lot of uh, tyrannical uh, emperors, like Ivan the Terrible. You don't find these people at all. Most of them are mediocre. And uh, many of them uh, suffer from certain kinds, uh, from the Freudian point of view, uh, suppression and re uh, regression. And so sometimes rebel against that uh, using the eunuchs and the in-laws. But in general, they, they perform uh, routine work, getting up uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, and dressed all properly to receive all the uh, all dignitaries, meaning that the bureaucrats, the people who are call things, then you retire. And then uh, you, you, you read all these documents. You know, every day, highly routinized, because we do have uh, what we call veritable records, almost daily records, what an emperor would do. So we can have a sense of, in actuality, how these people rule. Now, in my sense, in my, in my turn, the most enduring feature of that bureaucracy turned out to the bureaucracy itself. But because these people became uh, successful through examination. That examination based upon classics. Uh, and also, not just classics, memorizing classics or poetry, but also your ability to respond to critical issues of the time. For example, in addition, if you pass the written exam, there will be an oral one. Uh, the oral one is normally to ask how you deal with uh, the military campaign, how you deal with uh, foreign aggression, how do you deal with the uh, irrigation problem, how you deal with the starvation, uh, natural disaster. These are um, contemporary issues. Only 400 were elected every three years, and they would be sent to be local officials. And uh, sometimes one magistrate would be in control of a population of maybe a quarter of a million with no soldiers. Normally, no uh, police. And with a very small staff, sometimes only 10 or 15, relying very, very heavily upon the local bureaucrats. And of course, most of the people function uh, according to their, way, their own way of life. Then, of course, <laughs> the danger of rebellions and so forth. So in this particular connection, I think what, is, uh, what China is confronted with now, currently, the uh, market economy is not sustainable without a legal constraint. Well, everybody knows that. And the, the government, we call the state capitalism, <coughs> is, uh, is not only the question about efficiency, also, also the question about uh, corruption. And uh, almost virtually all the successful uh, entrepreneurs or billionaires in China are politically connected in, in some special way. And so that is neither acceptable by any liberal democratic idea nor acceptable uh, by the Confucian idea. The major question, I think, here is the, the difference between procedural democracy, you know, John Rawls's notion about the public, that's the political arena, in which he would consider religion uh, not legitimate. That's why the, the separation of church and state. Religion is a matter of the heart. And certainly, I think even in Habermas's work, uh, nature and religion, they are relegated to the background. They are not politically relevant. But now Habermas, as you know, in the last 10 years, was deeply involved in the, in the study of religion. So I, I think the question is not about the 
the mechanism of control is a question about the vision. The vision is what is politics. If politics is only try to fix the relationship between the individual and society, distribution of power, uh, contractual relationship, uh, different kind of uh, adversarial systems, that's one way of looking at it. The other one is much broader, and it will have to deal with uh, human flourishing in a very broad sense. Then you may have a different vision about what politics entails. Okay. Yeah, just to note that actually is the uh, uh, argument of both Plato and Aristotle uh, in uh, their writings on politics that uh, uh, the good uh, polis is meant to pr promote human flourishing and not simply mere survival. But. Mm -hmm.